right, so I will call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Select Board at 6.30 p.m. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes of June 12th, 2023. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Okay. All right, Mr. Walter, Trambley. All right, we have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, Mr. Walter, Trambley. All right, three nothing. Thank you very much. All right, our first new business today is an update from Senator Comerford. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate having you here. Um, we'd like to have our members of the Massachusetts Legislation come out and tell us how things are going and update us and all that. So please tell us what you're here to tell us. Thank you so much. It's really so good at the select board to make time. Uh, and I'm really so happy to be in Sunderland. Before the, before the meeting convened, we were talking about how beautiful an evening it is and how generally beautiful the town is. So um, thank you for your service. Um, and thank you, of course, Jeff, for all you do. Um, I bring greetings from Elena Cohen, who's our district director. Um, we both really appreciate the opportunity to serve Sunderland. I can't believe it, um, but it's we're in our third term um, for the town. Uh, and the district has changed just a bit. If it's OK, I'll give a brief update of what I've been up to. And then I'd love to have your questions. And Jeff sent over some areas, which I hope I touch on. Um, mm -hmm you know, as I give this update. So the Hampshire, Franklin, Worcester district right now is, uh-oh. <laughs> Wi-Fi isn't working for us either. Okay. <sighs> Sorry about that. Oh, no, <laughs> oh please. We, we actually have it on our uh, agenda. No, not necessarily this agenda, but our town agenda to get Wi-Fi repeaters that will make Who's the signal? a little less faulty yeah. here. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Which Wi-Fi are you on? That's what I was going to check. Button ball. So it's the secured one. I'm not online. So, um, you can continue the meeting and I can <laughs> try and work on this issue right. and get us back. Hopefully by the next time we have another vote to take, uh, we'll have <laughs> Crystal back. So, uh, okay. Sorry about that, please continue. No, stop. I'm with you in the internet problems. <laughs> um, so the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District is now 25 cities and towns. It was 24 uh, when I first ran, and that's because of redistricting. Yep. So back, you know, in the census triggers a redistricting process, and you know very well that we lost population here in Franklin County not as bad as Berkshire, which was worse. And it's what, but that generally, the loss of population and needing to you know, continue the work with Rep. Natalie Blay, who I'm very glad to work with, and of course, Congressman McGovern, um, on economic uh, activity, boosting our communities, I know you know this, um, has, you know, has me really engaged post-census. So um, we lost population, and I was handed a map uh, that would take it away a Senate seat. Uh, and I thought that wasn't good for our region. It would have had me going up into the North Berkshires. I probably would have kept Sunderland, um, but I would have uh, lost most of the district. And we would have lost a Senate seat. That's not good. It's not good for rural senators. It's not good for earmarks. It's not good for chairpersonships, all of that. So we fought. Um, and go be Eric Lesser, Adam Hines, and I. And we won, I'm happy to say. <clears throat> but in order for that to happen, I had to go over the Quabbin uh, to pick up population, and I lost Waitley and Coleraine and um, also Seth Hadley in order mm. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so the district now is more ideological, uh, ideologically diverse. Um, it's also much bigger, 781 square miles, um, and it's 25 cities and towns. So mm. 15 in Franklin County, five in Hampshire, and five in Worcester. Um, but I think, it's, I think we're stronger as a result of it, and we kept a senator. Um, so that's key, uh, and I'm really glad we won. Um, it was a big thing that I focused on last year. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so what am I doing? Uh, so I, I, right now I'm the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Higher Ed. I'm the Senate Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Agriculture. I've been named to the 21st Century Farm Commission. I'm also on the Assistant Vice Chair of the Joint Committee 
um, on ways and means. All of that puts me into leadership um, in the Senate, which is, I think, again, good for rural communities um, to have that voice at the table. And I actually think, I think the Senate is listening. In the last budget, I hope you agree, the Senate really focused um, pretty strongly on the needs of rural communities, you know, with great advocacy from the Western Mass delegation, both this session and in years past. Uh, so one of the things I threw down on was rural school aid. Um, we got that up to 15 million. The governor started it, Rep. Lake did it in the House, and then we were able to jack it up to 15 million. That's not 60, which was the promise of the rural, the, the charge of the Rural Schools Commission. So that's a big area of focus for me. Local aid, um, which was another thing Jeff was interested in. Uh, the Senate actually um, had a pretty good number on rural aid. It's 1.27 billion, or UGA. Um, and then there's money on top of that for some other administrative work by towns. Um, we were able to get 15 million for public health, 194 million for RTAs. Um, that's a record number. That's one of the ways we spent the fair share dollars. Uh, that will allow, if you know, if it holds, um, for our RTAs, the uh, FRTA and the PBTA, to run um, uh, innovative pilots. So you you may know uh, one of the things I focused on with um, FERCOG is on these pilots. We have, uh, through two earmarks I've been able to get, we've done these basically micro-transit pilots up in Franklin County, mm -hmm. and they've been really successful, wildly successful, oversubscribed, FRTA and FERCOG have been doing great, and we've used the money both to buy some infrastructure and do some training and things like that. Think of it like a public Uber, ride on demand. Um, but right now they're, for a very small cohort, they're high intensity service users, so, you know, community action clients, um, the uh, health center clients. This is good. We want them to get, you know, G some, some GCC students. We want them to get to the school, to the doctor, to their appointments, right? We want that. Um, but I want the whole public to have access to this mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that we can get people fed into the bigger bus lines. Um, Sunderland is much more densely populated than, say, Leiden. What I often say, and maybe you've heard me say it, is that we can't run those big buses up into the hills of Leiden, right. but we can send a zippy little public Uber right. um, to get that person either where they're going or into a feeder line, right, which also has to increase in frequency um, and in stop. So that's one of the areas that I focused majorly on is uh, advocating for the RTA funding, and then uh, I'll be advocating for that kind of carve out that I believe um, I know FRTA is interested in, and we're talking actually how much money they need, and I, I'm hoping PBTA will be. Mm -hmm. And then I'm hoping to secure a better north-south route for people, right? So it doesn't take an act of the legislature to get to Holyoke from yeah. here, right? <laughs> that's, 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 that's misguided. Yeah, it is, um, absolutely. Right? Oh, oh, Third select board member on the phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, I've also focused on, on, on tailoring uh, programs like Chapter 90 to rural communities. So you may have seen in the Senate's work in the transportation bond and then in the, um, and then in the budget, we've done twice now carve outs for rural communities. You know that Chapter 90 doesn't work for towns like Sunderland. You have the miles but not the people. Um, and so the Senate's sort of flipping that on its head and saying, okay, we're gonna give out this money based on people. I mean, sorry, based on miles first as a primary. Now we have the miles. Um, so that begins to look like something called regional equity mm -hmm. um, in that policy. And that's not the only policy that we can and should tailor um, to make, you know, to meet rural communities where you are. You know, local aid, rural school aid, local public health funding, all of those, you know, start to add up. Another place we made some gains is in pilot payment in lieu of taxes. Now Replay and I have a bill to actually fix the formula. Um, right now you know that um, it's, it's like a two-part problem. One is the money from the state that's been really bad, yep. although it's getting better. And the other is how is it giving out, given out. So right now, I'm sure you know, um, under Governor Baker, it became a relative uh, issue. So if Sunderland uh, had a piece of pilot land and it grew, say, by 5%, but Nantucket grew by 50%, um, even though um, Sunderland's value was lower than Nantucket's, it would actually get even relative value lowered even more 
as Nantucket went up because of the relative difference between low and high properties. Um, that is, of course, absurd, right? A piece of state on land should be valued in a commensurate way across the state. We should not look to property values. Mm -hmm. It's the way in which smaller towns with uh, cheaper property values gets get really uh, boxed out of yep. the kind of remuneration that states the state should pay for the stewarding of open land. Um, we're also talking now about uh, actually an adder for this program. Uh, you know that the state 2050 climate goal requires 15% uh, carbon sequestration to make the math work. Well, we have 7.5%. Um, so we, we need to actually get that up while we also get the green energy goals up. And so actually the land is very valuable. The trees are really valuable. Um, and you know we're breathing for the commonwealth, so we should be paid for it. And our farmers are feeding the commonwealth, and we're stewarding the water of the commonwealth. And all of that should be money. Um, so I've been focusing there. We have a bill on um, the Quabbin and how to actually see the Quabbin as a public good. And one of the things I wanted to say to Sunderland is, in addition to looking at the, the value of that water as a statewide good, public health necessity, I'm looking at the ways in which no plan for that water, right now 61 more communities out east want that water. Um, but there's no access for Franklin County to that water. So I'm thinking 50, 100 years from now, um, and I think we should have studies done at the same level that would help us understand what it would take for us to have water from the Quabbin, even as Eastern Mass draws more. So I'm thinking about things like that, both in the immediate and then also in the sort of longer term. Um, I just want to make sure that I covered, I covered rural aid chapter, oh, I didn't cover chapter 70. Let me just talk a second about chapter 70. Um, so chapter 70, um, a complex and flawed formula in the Rural School Act, which I have to, again, tip my hat to replay. She really led that commission with uh, Senator Hines, but I'm happy to be in there now um, as a strong partner, and I was during the process. Um, uh, you know, chapter 70 itself, we had the local commission um, on chapter 70. Um, it's called the Foundation Budget Review Commission. That came up with some fixes, but not all of the fixes actually work equally for Western Mass. Um, and that's why the Rural Schools Act sort of piles on top of Chapter 70. But there are things we can and should do to the formula, including special education. Mm -hmm. Right now, our special education is valued, as you know, as a statewide threshold. But there isn't one district in Western Massachusetts, in my district, in my, there isn't one school district in my Senate district that has special education numbers below the statewide threshold. Some of the bigger, wealthier communities, Wellesley, Winchester, the W's out east, um, sure, they have really low special education numbers, um, so they're actually made whole with what we have going, but not everyone. And so I'm, I'm looking with Senator Lewis on a, what we hope will be Secretary Tutwiler's convening of a Chapter 70 working group. We're not gonna open it up again, um, I think for a full foundation budget review, as um, much as I'd like, but we can look both at sort of how we're valuing some of the items inside Chapter 70 and then how we're paying for them. Our communities out here, um, we, because of what's called, a, um, I, don't, I won't get too, uh, too weedy or too wonky, but there's um, something called a CEY, a combined effort yield, that drives um, how much Sunderland has to pay. Um, now, with bigger, wealthier communities, everybody's capped at 82.5%, the thought being, oh, well, everybody has to have skin in the game, right? Okay, I can get that. Except um, a Wellesley could pay 10 times more um, than the state tells it, says it can and should, whereas Sunderland, you struggle, when I look at your numbers, to get to that, right? You're making tough choices around police and fire and other municipal needs to get there. That's not fair. Um, and all these wealthy communities that are capped, I think, is unfair. So some of the thinking statewide is coming actually from the Gil Montague area. They are the people um, you may know, Tupper Brown or Mike Naughton. Um, mm -hmm. They are crunching these numbers, and we just met with Senator Lewis, and he is quite moved by this. And so we're hoping that not only will the sort of spending side of Chapter 70 be looked at, but then also what the towns pay in, right? The sort of thinking of that as a two-sided coin. Um, and that's going to be really important for us. 
going forward. I don't think it's a quick road, by the way. And that we have to keep jacking up the single school aid, because I think this other road is deliberative and slow. But Secretary Tuckweiler, um, I invited him out for a visit. He was in the district. He heard from our superintendents. I think he understands. Um, he's beginning to understand, um, as a new secretary, the kind of stakes that are at play out here um, as districts fight to retain teachers at schools and um, deal with low and declining enrollment or sparse enrollment. Either way, um, it's really a, quite a brutal time yeah. um, for schools. So um, I'll stop. I'll take your questions and comments. And I, again, I just there isn't anything harder um, than local work, municipal work. I do know that, right? You get the, you have to deal with the state, you have to deal with the federal government, and it's not easy. Um, so I, I really want to work harder and smarter for Sunderland going forward, and I hope you think of Elena and I as available to the town for whatever we can do. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming to talk to us. Um, I'm really glad that you're thinking now about fresh water 1,500 years from now, because that's going to be the commodity that we're all fighting over in that period of time. Um, I think and having Boston drinking the water runoff of our half of the state without have to having access to that does not seem equitable. So I'm glad that that's being talked about now before it's necessary to talk about. Um, well, again, I guess it is necessary to talk about now, but you know, before it becomes a real pain point for the whole state. Um, so thank you for that. I mean, I, it does, it never leaves the back of my mind that we lost four towns in Western Mass so that Boston can drink fresh water, you know? Yeah. Um, Greenwich, man. Yep. Submerged. Yep. Actually, almost the day of the hearing on this bill, 85 years ago, mm -hmm. they were disincorporated. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I felt like there was might maybe some karmic energy mm -hmm. that the hearing was held by the Environment and Natural Resources, at, you know, at this really intense moment for our history out here. And I grew up in Shrewsbury, and so for us it was like, yeah, our neighbor town is no longer there, and there but the, you know, the lines that they drew go our town. Absolutely, um, and, so, and our economy was arrested, yep. right? Completely arrested. Those were thriving communities. And it threw a real wrench into the, the, the free trade and commerce between the east and the west of the state. You put this giant roadblock in the middle of the state that goes almost you know, half the distance of the state. Um, we no longer have easy routes. We have to go north, we have to go south, but it's, it's definitely a, a, you know, a burden to us. And I'm also glad that you're, you're talking about the cost of maintaining the forests in the state because um, as carbon sequestration, carbon sequestration, I can't say that word. Sequestration. Thank you. As that, um, and just in general, our carbon footprint becomes more and more important to track and to work on. Um, Boston doesn't have any ability to sequester carbon. They just where are they putting it? Unless they're starting to make like algae. You know, I've seen new technology coming out. Um, but the majority of, the, of that happening in the state is happening in Wendell, it's happening in the Berkshires, it's happening here in Sunderland. Sunderland. I was looking at a map, um, we were talking about Mount Toby, and I didn't even realize that a third of Sunderland is Mount Toby. Right. Uh, and that entire area is doing a lot of good for the, the carbon in the state. And so it would be nice if we, we and, you know, especially towns like Wendell, with the Wendell State Forest there, that's so much of their land and so much of their tax money goes to maintaining... Um, the emergency services right. and the police forces and whatnot that have to patrol there and have to rescue hikers in there and that kind of stuff without the equitable money. So. I agree with you. I completely agree with you. Um, I should have also said that um, with RepDOM, I'm working on a solar siting forum. Mm -hmm. I think about for our region, right? I think, one, we have to be compensated um, for the kind of carbon sequestration that we're doing in our farms, open lands, state owned lands. But then also, we are ground zero for the solar re revolution. And I think, you know, Sunderland folks probably want what I want, which is, you know, for us to get to the, you know, net zero by 2050. But I do think that we need the state, we must demand together that the state do better at helping us understand what is an equitable solar siting fo you know, footing for us. Um, these big, some of the solar companies are, you know, the ones out here we know, right? They're family owned for generations, they're, you know, you know, they've been doing many, many things over the years, and now they've pivoted to solar. And we know them, um, but many are multinational corporations, and they may flip something three times before the project goes, um, and they don't have the loyalty to our communities the way these local uh, businesses do, and I'm really worried about it. And so I have been talking to the EEA secretary, to the climate chief, Melissa Hoffer, and we are going to do this four-day 
um, summit, the town, we'll get the town notice, where we really can both have our towns and municipal leaders, you know, the planning committee, the energy committee, whatever it is that, you know, from each of these towns that wants to come um, tell the state, you know, what's not working, where the pain points are, and the state can help tell us what it's doing, and it is doing something under Governor Healy. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really important. Absolutely, absolutely. I um, mean, we've had the, the town solar here in Sunderland for quite a long time, and it's, you know, we need more of that. We don't, you know, we, we need to have state support, not just in a financial sense, to make it a smart move for towns to do, to make it a smart move for homeowners to do, but also just to have the will and the drive coming from the eastern part of the state to, to have that be a priority for everybody. Absolutely, um, and to work on interconnection. Absolutely. I mean, Sunderland really is a model um, for it in many ways in the way you've brought in solar. O other communities, just it's been a little bit more bumpy. Um, not fault of the community, just, you know, it's bumpy out there. Yep. It's turbulent. Yep. And that's something that if, if we as a state can do a better job of making it a smooth path, Oh, your town wants to do solar. Great, we have programs set up. We have money set up. We have, you know, we we have a, a plethora of contractors in the state that are licensed and, and bonded and do a good job. Um, then it's a no-brainer. It's an easy, it's easy thing, especially for small towns where all of the work being done towards those goals are all volunteer basis. No one's being paid to do that work. It's a lot easier when the grants are signed here rather than do research for six months and then please, you know. And, here, and here's a guideline for how to make these choices, these yep. really hard choices. Yep. You know, is, is this piece of land less advantageous than this piece of land? Ah, oh, okay, maybe it can't grow food or maybe whatever, for whatever reason, right? Okay, so we understand that and the town feels some relief that it's made the right climate decision. <laughs> um, and then we have to work with our utilities around interconnection. I would also encourage the state to prioritize manufacturing of, of green technologies in the state um, and you know provide money and support and tax breaks and whatnot to the, the companies that would be starting up in the, in, the, in the state or expanding their production. Um, because as time goes on, if we don't ramp up production, even if people in the state want to go solar, if the prices are going up because we're importing them from other states or from other countries, um, it, it, we need to make it so that the access to those resources is plentiful enough that we don't get to a point where people are getting in pricing wars over technology that we want to make as affordable as possible. Um, and you know, at, at the local level, you know, we, we can't do much to encourage a business to start a, a solar you know, manufacturing plant here in Sunderland, nor do we believe and have the industrial space to do so. Um, but the state has that both that scope and the buying power and the collective bargaining to be able to make that a, a priority. I think that's really smart. Um, you see me, I'm typing some notes. But <laughs> no, I think that's really smart. I think we should bring that up as part of the forum, but also just in terms of um, how we as a delegation are talking with the Healy Driscoll administration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have anything you want to No, I think that's great. Thank you for the updates. Crystal, oh. do you have uh, <laughs> any questions for... Is she on the line still? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Wonderful. I just wanted to also say just super quickly, one of the first things that the governor did and lieutenant governor was bring on a, a director of rural affairs. Yep. So you know that Anne Gobi, our fair sister, um, is now that director. And I'm sure if she hasn't already reached out, she will. And, you know, I really look forward to working with her and the delegation on a bunch of stuff. One of the things we're looking at is, um, initially, is, you know, these grants, the one-size-fits-all grants that don't fit us. Yep. Now, we've been talking, of course, to the administration about these over the years, but, you know, that plus other things, I think we, we can really see ourselves working in a harder and smarter way mm -hmm. um, to try to tell the administration, hey, that housing grant, well, we don't need 50 units. Um, but we don't want to be disadvantaged if we need 10 for elder housing, right? 10 going to do it for us out here in this particular community, for example. Um, and congratulations about all the developments that you've had, which are pretty beautiful. Oh my goodness, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, um, so that's happening, and I just also want to tell you that um, the Route 2 Rail project uh, that we've been stewarding is really quite gaining steam, so it's possible um, that we'll see soon more models for service along that northern tier corridor. 
mm -hmm. um, stopping in Greenfield or Orange or and or Orange, you know, uh, heading to Boston. That would be in addition to the North South Line and the line that you know goes from Pittsfield to Springfield um, and the Berkshire Flyer. So the delegation really is ramped up together for this, which I think you would want us to be, um, and hopefully it'll be one of one more of those sort of generators of interest in the region, uh, in addition to housing. And really last thing, um, we're bringing uh, Senator Lydia Edwards out uh, on a housing tour, mm -hmm. and I'll be speaking with folks to get good panels together to talk about the difference between urban and rural housing. Wonderful. In the Senate tax package, we have low-income housing tax credit, which is one of the places I threw down on. It's a progressive tax credit, so you might imagine, like crunchy lefty, but it's also really pragmatic. Our developers use it out here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, uh, I'm hoping it's, got, it's kept and it would be a real windfall for housing development in rural western Massachusetts. So I do have one quick question. Oh, sorry. Just, I've talked myself. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. So. Just a quick thing. On uh, ADUs and septic, it would oh. be great to get some guidance from the state on how uh, yeah, septic or people who have, are on septic can incorporate an ADU or, or build an ADU okay. and what that means for the septic system. Okay. I will take notes when I get out yeah, there. Yeah, no, just a quick thing. Like, the main thing yeah. is it's with bedrooms. If you, if you have a septic system that has three bedrooms, well, could you, is there a way to maybe change one of the bedrooms and make it a non-bedroom and then be able to add the ADU without having to go through a full upgrade? Because yeah, it's an expensive fine. process. Okay. Okay. Just I will get back to Jeff with an answer yeah. on that. Excellent. Um, we did put a septic, that Title Eight credit. Okay. We tripled that okay. for people who have to, uh, in the Senate, that was another thing. 30% of us are on septic yes. up here, right? Yep, that's right. Um, and so uh, that would be, if it goes through, it's now in conference. Um, but that's like that's another rural thing that the Senate listened to. They were like, all right, you people, you have septic. If it goes bad, you need a tax credit. Okay. So it would, it would triple the existing amount for a tax credit for people who have the unfortunate need to fix their septic or upgrade. Right. That's great. Uh, but I'll look at the ADU thing. Okay, and thank you. Excellent. Uh, one more thing also for me. Um, I'm glad you brought up uh, grants. It's an, it's an important thing we've actually talked a bit about is um, there's a certain threshold of size and money a town has to have in order to be able to pay a grant writer yes. or pay at least somebody professionally who will work on those. Um, and that makes a real sort of cliff in terms of, you know, you, you, smaller towns, smaller towns, smaller towns, no one's able to apply for grants after a certain point. Um, if there was some support either through FERCOG, which already does support us a lot in grant writing, if there was some state support to help their charter doing that and other COGS in, in Western Mass, um, or direct state aid, like grants that themselves would pay for a grant writer to get other grants, or um, you know, part of the, the Department of Rural Development having, a, having grant writers on staff who can be made available to town, something like that. Um, it's often hard, even if the dividends paid by the grants are high, it's often hard for towns to find the money up front to be able to pay for those grant writers. Um, even if it's smart long term, you still need to be able to pay for it this year when the dividends aren't going to pay for a couple of years down the line. Um, at with 100%. Um, so you're right that Linda does, Linda Dunleavy does. Yep. She did get some federal money to hire a grant writer. Have, have, are you contracting yep. with we, we, We've on been some? in communication with them about that. Um, and it's a great idea, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if we can make that, yeah. you know, get more state money behind that, help the help the cogs do that. I, I love that it, they're, we're doing it regionally rather than trying to individually have towns do that. Um, and we just need more of that. If I we can. agree. Yeah. Um, I totally agree. So here's a here's something maybe we can follow up on. Um, you know, and I also know that matches are a problem, right? Yep. Like, you know, twenty five percent match if it's required. That's hard. You know, it's hard for a small town to have that in your budget. So. Um, one thing is we have this grant workshop series. I don't know whether, have you been able to get to any of them? It's um, the one stop. Yeah, we do all these. So we've, we've joined together with um, Linda and Jim McGovern and others to, to put this grant workshop series for towns so that they see us in ways that are real, you mm -hmm. know, so people can go, uh, that doesn't make any sense for me. Or I work four jobs and I'm not going to complete that 40 page application. Like, they, it is good and important feedback. It's part of what I think Anne will do well, but also so that they can get the information they need. That doesn't fix your grant writer problem. Um, one of the things that you know I'd be happy to talk with Sunderland about is an 
year mark. Uh, like say, for example, if you said, hey, Joe, we'd like to hire a grant writer for X years. Um, could we work on that together? Mm -hmm. And that's, it's a slower process because it needs an earmark for me, and earmarks are tragically long. Yes. Um, <laughs> but that could happen, right? Or it could be an earmark and a, you know, a, some stipulated money, a 25% match for something, yeah. or some part of the match. And we could do that together um, over time. But you're right that we need to, we don't need, you're talking about a much bigger and important conversation, which is the state has to get more honest about how smaller towns don't have the ability to hire yeah. economic development people. Um, and so um, I totally agree. And I, I brought that word, but I will keep on it. But even, even in terms of the, the workshops that get run and whatnot, which are, I'm, I'm glad that you guys do those. No, I know. But for towns like ours, where everyone's volunteer, yes. I haven't made any of your workshops this year because I'm always working, or yeah. I've got three committees after this one. Um, yeah. And so the, that's, the, that's sort of the divide there, is that uh, 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 Holyoke Springfield, their paid members of their government have the daytime hours, have the energy and the, you know, the ability to be able to go to workshops and, and meet with people during business hours. And it's just really hard for an all-volunteer government like ours, with a few notable exceptions, um, to be able to uh, you know, do, do any of these things. Um, and I, on that note, I would encourage, and not, not saying that this has been a problem, but I would encourage um, after hours and weekend options for those. Um, a lot of stuff ends up being you know, 11 a.m. on a Thursday, and I'm at work. Um, but it'd be great if we could or even online, something you do after yeah. that. Yeah, or, exactly, or, or offer a, a follow-up or a recording or something like that. And again, yeah. you may or you are doing these things. We do um, offer recordings, but we could do better in scheduling. Mm -hmm. We could do early morning, afternoons, weekends, nights. Like, we could do, we could flip it up a little bit more. You're totally right. I mean, these are great critiques, and it's important. Um, yeah. But if, and if you wanted to go right at that, you know, the earmark conversation, we don't have to have it now. But I'd be happy to think with Sunderland about, you know, your long-term plans. Yeah, we'll talk with Jeff about that and we'll and where you have want to go and, and you know, what you're interested in. The, the thing that could happen is, you know, I, I'm not, I, I won't say what Sunderland wants, but like if it's in the economic development world, you know, a mass works grant, you know, we can get the secretary out here um, or the assistant undersecretary, you know, they're good people, they know Sunderland because of your good work. Um, you know, connect meetings, it could help facilitate or sort of, you know, warm the, form the relationship so they could give feedback. Again, sort of a leg up in that way. Um, you know, these things would be fun to do, and I'd love to do them with you. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think you're talking about actually money for someone to actually put pen to paper, which I agree is also needed. Um, but if you wanted to open that conversation about planning, I'd love it. It'd be super fun to do. That would be great, yeah. And You've already done so much. Um, but if I could jump in and help with what your next thing is, I'd yeah. love no, we, we will we will be in touch about that. Great. Um, we'll talk with Jeff about that and figure out what our priorities are and how we want to move forward with that. Great. That'd Definitely. be great if we could have some support there. Cause, oh, yeah. And, and you know, it's, that, that's, again, one of those things where, um, you know, I'm reading through what's, what's in the Senate budget and what's in the House budget, and there's all these earmarks for things, and I kind of go, well, where's Sunderland's earmark? It'd be nice. Mm -hmm. And part of that is advocacy from members of the local government. You know, we don't have the time and the staff to advocate the way Boston does to their representatives for earmarks for things. Um, and so, yeah, it's good yeah. to have support on your end to us as well on that. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I wanted to get out sort of per personally. You know, I try to get to things, but I wanted to get out personally. I mean, part of it is this is a bigger conversation for us to have in Western Mass. You know, the Boston folks, you know, they might have, a, you know, a handful of blocks, right? And you know this. Um, where we have 25 cities and towns. And so it sometimes, often, earmarks from us, you know, I've, I've done okay for earmarks, but it, it, they go regionally, you know, to something that's gonna, you know, help five towns at the same time. Yep. You know, which it made me think, you know, if, if we could talk to Linda about hiring a grant writer at the state level, I know she's doing federal stuff, but you know, if we could get a state grant writer, we did talk to the Collins Center, by the way, to see if we could hook the Collins Center in, and then go out to towns and say, hey, you know, we can we paid the Collins Center for five towns. Do you want that? And it it, it didn't want it didn't want that. The Collins Center didn't want that idea. So we'll do we have, we're going to keep going. But yep. um, 
it is a, it is really a regional equity issue because um, our money is often dedicated regionally um, because so many towns are there are so many towns it's impossible to go as deep as we would want to um, for any one town but you know but not impossible yeah right it's not impossible well, I mean, and in talking about regional equity and your living example of that, the number of miles you drive to do your job versus that rep in, or that, that senator from Eastern Mass whose entire entire district is, you know, you can stand on top of a building and see it all in one, you know, Moose Mufasa kind of way. It's, it's the amount of work that you have to do to just do the same amount of, you know, impact as your colleagues um, is also a form of, of regional equity that's it's a thing. I mean... I would, I would probably be shocked at the amount of gas you spend per year. <laughs> did ditch the van, the mom van. <laughs> my wife bought two used Priuses, and yep. I was like, because we are not doing Oh, yes, the, 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 the Prius is the official car of Western Mass representatives yes. and senators because it's the, huh, if I'm going to drive 40,000 miles this year, I should probably get something that gets 40 miles per gallon. Yeah, so I certainly 38,000 my first year. Yeah. So now you're not far off. It's it's a couple miles. Yeah, yeah, but this now the district is so much bigger. It's good, I, I'm not even counting the miles. <laughs> you need you know, it's east west rail is what we need, so you can get around yeah. easier. I'm on it. I'm on it for sure. Wonderful. So, well, thank now, you. Oh. Now, before she leaves, do ch check your text messages, please. Sure. Oh. I have one. Ah. Not me. No. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Without working, I think it's just kind of hard here tonight. I got something from Wendy? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, that's from you? No, that's from Wendy. Oh, okay. Uh, Wendy would like our, you to... Our town uh, clerk would like to say that she appreciates the work, helping small towns fund the extra costs and the new responsibilities on town clerks. I think she's talking about elections. Yes, yeah, election. of the Votes Act and to help fund for extra help to facilitate the huge volume that comes with elections now. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday <laughs> for the Clerk's Day at the Hill. I am. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yes, I will be there on Wednesday to see the gorgeous clerks from our district. You know, the, the Voting um, Act is, the Votes Act is actually a good example of one size fits all policy not not fitting everyone so we did put in and maybe we can double back on this we did put in provisions we led the provisions that would allow towns to reduce the number of hours based on population but i still know it's so much work um, for small towns um, and i know Sunderland cares about access to the ballot so that's an, a question um, i know you care about that i know wendy is you know top of the line, <laughs> top of the pile of clerks. It's just, we have, to, we have to fund it better, and we also have to keep looking at the ways in which um, voting expansion is much more pragmatically tailored. Um, and actually, it's interesting, I think we also have to talk about it as a progressive good. When I did that, I got a lot of heat from progressives, like, what do you do when you're trying to curtail access to the ballot? And I was like, uh, no. I'm trying to help small towns survive this. Um, and we have to figure out the right balance between voting expansion and, and rural, the needs of rural communities. And it's, uh, we have to do better. Wendy is correct that we have to do better. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Are you also, Crystal? Anything else? <coughs> I think that might be good. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We it's always a appreciate you coming out. Oh yeah, let's you know, let's be in touch. We will definitely be in touch. Next on our agenda is the sick bank policy. Jeff. Yes. Um, two weeks ago, the personnel committee recommended that we amend the sick bank policy to allow new employees to take advantage of it um, and. The idea was we don't we want to limit our our our, our li potential liability, um, so we still want to limit the number of hours. And so what I've done is amended the um, policy under management section five 
uh, now says total sick leave in the bank may accumulate year to year but shall not exceed 600 hours from year to year. Qualified employees who have not previously donated to the bank may do so regardless of the existing number of hours in the bank. If this causes the uh, should say sick bank to exceed 600 hours on July 1st of the following year, the bank will be reduced to 600 hours. Now, if let just want to clarify something. Let's say that we start the year of 600 hours. Mm -hmm. Whole bunch of new employees put it in. It goes up to 1,200 hours by December. Someone has a qualifying thing happen in January. Are there 600 hours available total at that point, or is the full 1,200 hours available until the, it, it clears the next year? Um, that's a good question. I I would imagine that. So you're talking about basically a uh, use of the sick bank that crosses fiscal years? No, specifically that, you know, like currently it's capped at 600. Right. So some, let's say three of our employees all have events in the same time and they're all out for, you know, 500 hours each over the course of the year. It's 1,500 hours. Where currently we have 600 hours that they could, but between the three of them split up cutting back on the amount of, of unpaid hours or how much they have to, whatever their their plan B is in that situation. Um, I'm just wondering if we had those same three employees have on this new plan and, we, and people put in 1,200 hours, can they use 1,200 hours out of that over the year or are we still capping the total number of hours being used at 600? Because, and not that it's happened in the past, but this could be a way of having you know, the, the whole point of limiting it is so that we don't end up having the town have nobody working all these jobs all, all the time because they're able, we're able to be out more than, at this point we can be out 600 additional hours beyond what the people get for their allotments. I'm just worried that we're gonna get to a point where we have a bad year and we're out 1200 hours without there being a cap on the number that can be used per year. So I guess I would say that it is discretionary. So even if somebody asks for 1,200 hours, you can give them one hour. Mm. Um, so that's one check on it. If there's, you know, I won't say abuse of the system, but significant use, mm -hmm. um, I think that, that both the personnel committee and the select board would take that into account. My, I, I don't have a, a clear cut answer for you. I think what I would suggest is that yes, they could use up to that 1200 because they were donated and the town, as long as we're not backfilling those positions, mm -hmm. you know, it's not really costing the town anything um, for that year and then it gets reduced. But um, if you think that, or if the select board thinks that that's not a wise decision and, and we should Cast? So, yeah. I think page two of the document and then section five kind of helps with that situation, right? Once the, and I have another comment on this also, but once it gets, right now it says down to 40 hours, people can donate time again in that year, correct? Yes. So, even if, so we'll take people who haven't used any sick time who are going to be totally capable of, you might have 10 people who can go ahead and donate 24 hours, and boom, you're going to increase that number by 240 more hours. That's a good point. So currently, there is already a mechanic that would allow, if it was a really busy year like that, would allow other people to continue to donate hours. Okay, that makes me feel better because I just want to make sure we're not opening ourselves up for a situation that didn't already exist, or at least that we talked about that. But yeah, that makes sense that if, so yeah, if by December you've already used the 600 hours, a bunch of people who have time that's already going to expire redonate, we could see ourselves having 1,200 already. Okay, that makes sense. All right, well, if that's the case, then, then I've got no problem moving forward with that then. Thank you, Crystal. So, yeah, so that leads me to another question about that, though. Though, when it drop, that's saying it dr has to drop to 40 hours before people can donate more time? Yep. And I'm just, is that just an arbitrary 
once it gets to 40 hours, because that's really only a week of time, right? Yep. Could we bump that number up? So, for example, say when it hits, and again, I don't know what the right number is, but when it hits 300 hours, we've depleted it by half. People could donate time again. I don't, I guess I just, you know, because I wasn't here when this was originally drafted up, I guess I don't know what the significance of the depleting it all the way down to 40 hours is. So my guess, and obviously I wasn't here either, is, hey, if it gets to 40 hours, we can give one person a week off and that gives us time to tell everybody to donate more, (laughs) you know, Uh, that is my guess. Yeah. And I think that it's. It's a it's a balancing act, right? Because yeah, we could keep we can allow people to keep refilling at three hundred if we want to be if we want to have a bank of six hundred hours constantly that can be used. I mean, it, yeah. it may have been that the select board said, "Hey, we're gonna do this," but we you know it, we understand that it could cost the town. We don't know how uh, you know when they developed it, so we don't want to keep it that high maybe they yeah. were hoping it would stay lower right and I, and again i think at this point and again i could be totally misunderstanding the concept of that but i think now that this sick bank policy has been in place for you know for a fair amount of time and when was the last time someone took out of it four years ago yeah which is what's been stopping everybody from being able to join it previous to this amendment to it. I don't think we're seeing abuse or, you know, huge amounts of time off requests coming in on that. So, you know, I don't know if we want to create a little bit bigger of a buffer there than the 40 hours and have to do something within a week. I mean, I, I would be fine with upping the the floor on that from 40 to, I don't know, 160, something like that, four weeks a month, you know. Because um, I agree that, you know, it would make sense. That, you, that way you don't have to rush around if there was a, a need for that. Um, and given the history, the chan- chances are that we're having a lot of discussion for something that will never be an issue. You know, what are the chances that we have three, four employees all at the same time that need, you know, months at a time? Um, but, you know, it's probably good for us to at least have talked about it ahead of time. Um, and I mean, it, philosophically, this is time that we are contractually obligated to provide to our employees that if they were taking more sick days, they'd be using. And so it's not like we're, they're, people are getting free time that they didn't, that somebody they didn't work for. It's that we're giving a path to allow some of that time to go to good use rather than just to disappear into the ether. Um, and so I kind of feel like if we can do something to support that, it's a great idea. I mean, I remember when my twins were born, the company I was working at at the time, a whole bunch of people each donated some a little bit of their extra time, and I was able to get an extra week of paternity leave to be with my babies, and it was great. And so that kind of spirit, I think, is, the, is at the heart of this. And what we're trying to do is allow some more sort of more stable employees that whose lives aren't in flux to be able to help out the ones whose lives are in flux and i think that's a good thing so um you know if we can make this something that's, that's more more useful and effective for the especially our newer employees and that's why we're doing this whole thing in the first place is to make sure our newer employees are able to take advantage of that uh and not be you know arbitrarily cut out of the system all right do you want us to vote on uh, adopting this uh, yes, and clarify if you want to change 40 to 160. Um, how about we take a quick vote on the 40 to 160 and then we'll vote on the whole thing. So I would... Yeah, so I guess if we're looking at the 160, and again, Jeff, you have much more experience with the speed of how this could happen, right? Mm-hmm. So say it had dropped down... Somebody puts in a request for the time, you know, for some additional time off that say is, you know, they're going to be having hip replacement and they need six weeks additional time, just as an example. So they put in the request, the clock starts ticking. How long 
would that take to bump that number up, you know, to get, to notify people, we have a request, you, if you have additional time that you want to put in the bank, let's put it in, see what we come up with to understand, you know, if we, ha- what we can accommodate this person for, set up a personnel committee meeting, bring it to the select board to be addressed, all of that. What are we looking at for a time frame there for the time the person puts the request in to the time the select board would actually approve it? Well, um, it would go to the personnel committee first and then the select right. board. So, you know, um, no quicker. Well, I mean, if it was an emergency, we could call emergency meetings and, and do it yeah. quickly. Um, obviously, 48 hours for posting. So, I mean, I, I think a week is. I think that more than a week is helpful, especially like. Okay. Hey, the select board doesn't meet every week. Do you really want me to call you in here <laughs> because of We're this? We're all on vacation on July on July third next right. week. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if we bump it up to roughly four weeks of pay, we would know that at least that money is in there. That people don't have to get a hold of payroll, donate more time, things like that. Yeah. That would give us a little more wiggle room on that. And we should also have some amount of heads up if you want to keep it at 40 because people have to use all their paid time off before they can apply to the sick thing. So we're going to know yeah. that there that it's or I hope we would know that it's coming, you know, before we actually have to approve it, um, that we're getting closer. So, okay. Unless it's, you know, right at the end of the year, right? Yeah. Somebody gets in, God forbid, a motor vehicle accident needs time off you know that isn't a planned situation right yep. so yeah um right if they don't vacation or sick yep so i mean i guess so yeah. the question would be we could go the other direction on it and just allow people to donate as much time as they want to in july let it go up as high as you want it to go and then it still sets back to 600 in july but effectively the same amount of money would be available to people. It's just it would already be in the fund and we wouldn't have to go asking for more money. Um, but I, I wonder if, and I'm just thinking about some of the people who have been here a long time and they would basically be donating all of their sick time every year. Mm-hmm. Um, how big the bank gets, and I guess it doesn't. But really it still matter. resets to six hundred at the end of the year, and what we're talking about now is you can only yeah. fill your tank up to halfway, but you can fill up as many times as you want. Versus let them fill it up to the top, and it's the same at the end of the day. It, 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 there's a mechanism either way for employees in town to effectively use as much of that extra free, free time as people are willing to donate. If, if, if it's a, a really bad year, five people are out. Maybe we go back to them six times because we hit that $160 level and people keep donating. But if there is no effective cap on how much can totally be used over the course of a year, if it's available, um, I don't see a reason why we can't just be like, put, put everything you want to put in for the year in and it's, just know that it's going to reset back to 600 in, in July. Um, I think it just kind of simplifies things a little bit. So just thinking through this, I mean, are we ever going to get to a point where it gets to 40 hours? I mean, I guess my point is I think that you're going to wind up having 600 plus hours constantly, even if you have people using the sick bank, because now you're above 600 every year and people, you know, use it maybe once every four years, you're just going to go up back to 600, up back to six. You're never going to go below 600 unless you have multiple people with significant yeah. Uh, I guess right. I guess we're, we're kind of splitting hairs about something that is almost assuredly not going to be a problem. Yeah, I mean, I see your point. I, I don't disagree with it. I just so let's, let's for now not worry too much about going super outside the box since it's we're we're all just talking about different ways of getting to the same place. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept the new policy with the caveat that we change the forty to one hundred and sixty hours for the the point at which the bank is able to be refilled. 
Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. So moved. Crystal, did you second that? Crystal, Drake, Chumbly, second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, Crystal, Drake, Chumbly. All right, three nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Now that we got that out of the way, we are up to old business. Uh, first one is select board updates. Um, had a fun time at the Deerfield 350th Parade. Uh, ended up getting to, me and Crystal ended up riding with the Deerfield select board, which was fun. Um, it was an interesting parade. So well, thank you for the Deerfield uh, for inviting us to that. Um, other than that, I don't have anything. Game, do you have anything? No. Nope. Crystal, do you have any updates for us? Yeah, so I had a um, South County EMS meeting. We're going to try to meet. Typically, they don't meet throughout the summer, but we're going to be meeting, it looks like, every couple weeks because, obviously, um, things need to be done to fill the director's position, which is leaving. Um, we'll be going over the the job description, things like that, prior to it getting posted, just because, you know, they haven't had to hire into that position for 10 years or so, so things change throughout the course of 10 years, so we want to just make sure that it's a real and, you know, a, a better understanding of what the job really entails before it goes out to bid, you know, out for posting for people to you know, start filling out applications and, you know, expressing interest in that job. But that was about it for me. Thank you for the update. And I appreciate you um, working on that um, oversight committee. It's a very important thing for us. Uh, all right. I think that's it for our select board updates, town administrator updates. Yes. There were a couple things that came in um, unexpectedly. I just wanted to raise um, the there was a capital project at the elementary school to put air conditioning in the library and I believe that was about eleven thousand dollars the school got an updated quote that's about four thousand more but the vendor said you can also apply for a reimbursement of up to nine thousand um, dollars which would bring us back you know about five thousand below what we thought we were going to have to pay. So the catch is that we have to put all the money up front and then we get reimbursed. So if that is a route that the select board would like to take, um, I would suggest appropriate or um, using the remaining money in ARPA. That yeah, I need to put ARPA. Yeah. Um, do you want us to do a, a vote on that today? I, the school would love it. Okay. Yeah. What's the certain so, What's the I certain do have a mean? question about that. Yep. So, the, and again, I'm sure it was wording, but I just want to be clear on this. It's a guarantee <laughs> that the 9000 is coming back after this is it done? Is, no. It is not a guarantee, which is why the school okay. did not just do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, I mean, they, they, basically said you're going to get it, but, you know, it, not sure when. Or um, was, what's the up to? Was it 9K or it could be 6 or 5? or? I This <laughs> is the information that, yeah. that the school gave me. I can get more. Um, no, I mean, I think it probably has to be done. It was, you know, more on my side, you know, is this a definite we're going to get that money back? And then, again, if we appropriate that additional funding out of ARPA, fine, you know, that's the place to take it from, but then that rebate goes back into capital? Uh, I think it would go into the general fund. And that would the be general the general fund. Okay, that, right, right. yeah, Versus. so it would be free cash in two years. Okay. Okay, so, you know, Sorry to not understand yeah. all this, but I just want to make sure, you know, I because I, I just want to make sure that it, it doesn't kind of get lost someplace floating around where it's like, oh, look, we got this extra money in a budget someplace. Let's spend it. 
So if it's going back into, when the rebate comes in, if it goes back into free cash, I'm fine with that. Yeah. If it goes other places to be spent discretionary, I'm not so sure, you know, that's the same thing. Yeah, that's no, it, it would it would come back to the town in, in mm-hmm. the general fund. Okay. I mean, from my perspective, the library needs air conditioning. We knew things were going to be more expensive than what we were quoted a couple of years ago for across the board. We did our best guesses on things, and, you know, this, it's more expensive than it was before. Um, you know, even if we were, there was no rebate attached, the school's coming to us saying you need five more thousand dollars to do this, I'd be pointing up the money either way. Uh, it needs to be done. Um, knowing that we could potentially come out ahead on this is icing on the cake, but, it, you know, we, we, we need to have students who are comfortable and books that are climate controlled and whatnot. It's an important part of, you know, maintaining the library. So um, I, would vote, I would vote to approve that either way. Um, but any more discussion on that? No, I'm fine. All right. So I would, I would entertain a motion to appropriate $5,000 from ARPA funds to uh, fund the air conditioners in the library. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, Christopher Chambler. All right, three nothing. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, so the, also, the school is asking both for the library AC project and the um, oil tank replacement project, who should be the signatory um, on those contracts. Typically it's been the town administrator because it's a town building, um, even though the school really runs the project in the day to day. Um, just having somebody in, in this building you know, looking, oh, reviewing the project, another set of eyes um, is what we did in the past, but the school said that they would be okay signing them, signing the contracts too, and, and just being totally responsible. So. From your perspective, which way would you rather go on that? Um, it makes me more comfortable to be involved, but I'm a little micromanager <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I have full, faith in, in Darius and Shelley and, and don't have any doubts that they would do the right thing, but ultimately it's the town's building and I think that if something were to happen, it would come back on us mm-hmm. and if we're not involved at all, that I don't know how I'd feel about that. I'm just trying to balance having our hands in, in the cookie jar a little bit, but also um, not having you just add more to your plate because I know that you do a lot. If you don't think it's going to be a huge burden and this is something that you think we should go on, I, I would be, I would prefer to keep it in house. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is how we did it with the elementary school project and I yeah. thought it worked well. I talked to Shelly this morning. She agreed that it, it was pretty smooth and was happy if we continued doing that. So. Okay, so yeah, if, if I, I would be more comfortable having you be the signatory then on that. Okay. Um, Crystal, do you have an opinion on that? No, I'm very comfortable with Jeff being involved because, again, I think Jeff's right. At the end of the day, um, you know, it's a town building. Okay, so the ta- it'll be a contract between the town of Sunderland and the contractor. The select board's probably going to sign the contract, and I'm going to be any change orders, you know, approve yep. things like that. Okay, great. I don't need a vote on that. The next thing, which I wasn't expecting to bring up, but... Um, I will, and hopefully we can get done, is the accounting services contract. So we put out the RFP. We got two responses. Um, one, I, I am disqualifying because um, they, did, they were not particularly responsive. Uh, their plan of service didn't make sense to me. They talked about doing market analysis and stuff that I didn't seem to make sense for accounting services. Um, and they didn't follow the directions. They didn't give us, they gave us an hourly rate, not an annual rate. Um, and it seemed from their website that they were sort of a company focused on moving people to the cloud and not so much on accounting. Um, it, it seemed like they found a, a, an accountant in Massachusetts and said, hey, if we win this, will you be the accountant? Um, so I, it just not, not a whole lot of confidence in the fact that they didn't 
follow directions I thought was worthy of disqualification. Yeah. So the remaining um, uh, respondents were Aponte and Aponte, who we're currently with. Um, their proposal was pay them the same amount that we're paying them now. Um, and so I guess I would ask for a vote to award the fiscal year 24 accounting contract to Aponte and Aponte. And from your perspective, we've been happy with them in this traditional process. Yep, they, they've okay. been responsive. They've been working with us really well. I've, I've gotten good feedback. There's some we changes. We also know what accounting software they use, so we don't have to put a new one next year, which would be lovely. Yes. Okay. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. Thank you for doing your due diligence with the, with the bids. Um, it's important for us to know the context around that, not just this is the, the dollar amount they're saying, but this is the intangibles that make me confident or nervous about them. And so thank you for that analysis for us. Um, I would entertain a motion to award the contract to Ponte and Ponte. Motion to award to Ponte and Ponte. All right, do we have a second? I second it. Crystal All right, we have a motion made and seconded to award the accounting contract for fiscal year 2024 to Aponte and Aponte. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, Crystal Dirk, John Black. All right, three nothing. Thank you. And then the last thing, just to hopefully close the loop on this, um, I, I just, for, for people that are out there, so we're gonna, <laughs> we're, we're switching accounting software we need to close out this fiscal year. The current accounting software is requiring us to sign a one-year um, license with them, even though we're not going to need it for one year. It's hot. Is it hot in here? It is. Okay, good. <laughs> I was thinking, it might be sweating. Um, sorry. So we've reduced the number of, of users on that license. We've minimized the cost as much as we can. Um, it's still going to be about $12,000. However, with that, with the new software and with our accountant, we are still within what we budgeted for accounting this year. Okay. So I think that we're okay, but I, I did want to mention that um, in case you see a bill for our old accounting software and you're like, why are we still paying And I'm assuming that we've ruled out the possibility of just being like, okay, we're gonna switch everything over before the new year starts with that software. We have no choice but to stick with that for the think, three months. Yes, because we have to close out. Okay, I, I but we're that was the starting case. July first with the new software, yeah. so everything for this fiscal yeah. year. Um, and it's and it, as you said, I think you said before, it's three months or so that we have of we're gonna use of the twelve. You know, I don't love wasting nine months of money, but at the same time, three months isn't three days. I would be really upset if we were this close and we had to pay a year's for two weeks or something like that. Three months is a good chunk of time and it is what it is. We don't have a whole lot of choice, so take our lumps and move on. Um, and if there's anything weird going on, we have access to it for those other yep. you know, nine months that we yep. can check. Okay, great. Is that all your updates? That is all my updates. All right, so the last thing on our agenda is the call firefighter special legislation. Um, and this is the correspondence that we are sending to the Senate, or the House, the House, yeah. um, asking for special legislation to allow one of our firefighters to stay on past the age of sixty. Did you need us to do anything, or just sixty-five? Sixty-five. Sixty-five. Okay, sorry, sixty-five. Um, did you need us to do anything special, or just we wanted to bring it up in the open session? In the no. Yeah. Uh, town meeting authorized the select board to request yeah. this, so it was just. Following through on that. Okay, great. So we will, of course, sign that and get that sent out um, as per uh, town meeting and previous discussions. Wonderful. All right. That is everything on the agenda. Anyone have anything else before we call a day? Just the next meeting and uh, the office will be closed. That would be helpful, yes. All right. Uh, last thing before we close, uh, other important dates to remember. Our next meeting will be Monday, July 10th. We are not meeting next week. Um, due to the proximity to July 4th. Um, and the town offices will be closed next Tuesday, July 4th, 2023 for Independence Day observation. So uh, if you are planning on coming into the office that week, come Monday or come on Wednesday because no one will be here on Tuesday. All right, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second, I uh, Crystal Drake. Trembling. All right, we have a motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Crystal Drake, Tremblay. All right, three nothing.
Thank you, Crystal. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah.